guys. Uh, my name is Taufik and welcome to another installment of Friday Hacks. And today we are going to have a talk by some lovely folks at Hudson River Trading and um, they're going to talk about engineering for latency and the technical hurdles in automated trading. So let's give them a round of applause. Hi everyone. Um, good evening and welcome to today's session. Um, I think we can say that we are happy to be back. Uh, our speakers today, they were here last year. We had a great response and we thought why not come back. So I hope you enjoy the talk. Um, very briefly about myself, and I'll just set the stage for why are we here today and what are we actually talking about. Uh, I'm, let me move the slides as well. Um, my name is Pranav, I'm an algo developer at Hudson River Trading. Um, Algo developer, as, 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 as Algo developer, uh, we build predictive models, we build use takes and algorithms, and come up with strategies that do automated trading in the financial markets. So in some essence, we set the problem statement, uh, and then the speakers that you will be hearing from later basically work on the implementation. So our job is quite easy. So what was, what were the financial markets about three decades ago? This picture is worth a thousand words, to be honest. On the left is Chicago Mercantile Exchange, CME, one of the biggest exchanges doing commodities and futures trading. 1994, actually even much later than that, trading used to happen with hundreds of people like that on the trading floor, they used to be called pit traders, shouting at the top of their voice. The one who could shout louder used to win the battle. And they used to print tickets, they used to write their trades on a piece of paper. And that was the exchange with financial markets back in the day. And on the right, it's what we call an exchange today. It's cold, it's freezing, and it's basically a data center. With optical cables, with basically thousands of cores and computers out there. So we have been fortunate to be part of this big change in the financial markets. In 2002, a bunch of young college grads, they came together and they thought that we could build predictive models, we can automate stuff, and we can actually do a much better job at predicting markets than a human trader could. So a combination of maths, statistics, computers, algorithms came together and HRT was born. And boy, were they right. Uh, I don't think they imagined how quickly the world would change and how quickly the trading would be replaced from human traders to computers. I think right now, the order of 60%, maybe even more than that, 70% trading on the exchanges is by automated systems. So, latency is a very critical piece of high frequency trading and automation, and automated trading. Um, to give you some context over here, the way it works is that first and foremost, we have a lot of historical data. It's pretty massive. It is, it's, I think every day we generate data of the order of terabytes, which is just raw data. And we build predictive models by modern statistical learning, machine learning, AI, you can name it. We build predictive models that predict what will happen to a particular financial instrument, sometimes a few seconds, sometimes a few hours. These can be fairly complex models, but also a fairly simple idea. Coming up with a model is not, in itself is not enough. How do you implement it in a way which is computationally complex, intensive, and how do you win this competitive race? It's a very competitive race. How do you win the race? And that's all why we care about latency so much. Our speakers here will talk about a different couple of topics that we hope will give you a sneak peek into some of the problems that we address, that we work on, and what give us a competitive edge in our trading. We are not unique, by the way, in the problem statement that we work on. Uh, there are a few uh, exceptional organizations that do the same, and that's kind of what makes it competitive and a fun place where you're also competing with the world in a real life problem, as well as tinkering and solving problems on your own. So I'll introduce the speakers very quickly, and I'll be out of your way in no time. Um, 
we actually, I don't know, uh, is there anybody who was here attending this talk last year? Out of curiosity, hands up. Okay, cool. So some of you might recognize them, but yeah, we're a new crowd. <laughs> um, Pierre will be the first speaker. He'll talk about performance engineering. What optimization can we do? Can we do to be able to basically process a lot of this data that's coming in, a lot of things that we need to be doing? And then Noni uh, will be talking about how we deploy FPGAs and hardwares uh, in our trading, and in both our predictive modeling as well as our trading. Uh, architecture. So with that, uh, please welcome Pierre. So, hello, my name is Pierre. Um, that is me before that I had started on Movember. Um, I studied mathematics and computing at Imperial, and what that really means is the first language I was introduced to uh, in, my, in, a, in my bathroom was Haskell. And that is to say, I am really, 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 and I really want to stress that point, I am not a C++ developer. I do really much prefer um, using higher level languages. So Python is pretty much my daily driver, but I do like to dabble in other things. Um, so array languages, API and J, Erlang on the functional side, I've been doing a bit of Go recently. Um, but generally speaking, um, and what sort of led me to be here today and present to you guys is the fact that I really enjoy figuring out how things work. So from that perspective, um, you'll hopefully get some insights into some of the things that we do that you can take back on your own projects. You don't have to be a C++ developer, you don't have to have like, a huge technical background to essentially go through the material that we are going to cover in the next 15 minutes or so. Cool, so why is, um, again, latency or performance uh, important to us? And for this, we need a little bit of context. So here we have um, like a simplified view of the world. The top half is pretty much external to HRT, and the bottom half is internal to us. So we deal with uh, exchanges. So like in Singapore, that would be the uh, Singapore Stock Exchange. And pretty much every exchange that we deal with will have its own proprietary messaging format. Um, that's not always the case, but I think it's, it's safer to assume it that way. In HRT, however, um, we like all our tools, all our processes and the like to essentially speak the same language. And what that means is when we subscribe to market data and that hits HRT's services, we translate this into like a, an internal layer that everything inside of HRT understands. That data is then fed back to our algorithms so that's the good stuff that um, Fran works on. And essentially, the orders come out. They're going to be, again, in some internal uh, format specific to HRT before hitting, essentially, the boundary back into the outside world and down to the market. So how quickly we sort of iterate through this will often dictate how successful or how profitable we are. The slower we are, more people will be tested a bunch. So, to dig, it, to dig into this a, a wheel bit, let's have a quick look at what we mean by processing a lot of data. So this is like a, a half a second window looking at data coming in from S&P 500 futures, so US-based uh, um, trading primarily. And you might have assumed that the data that we get is essentially like a gentle stream or something somewhat constant, and unfortunately that's really not the case. So we can see that at the beginning in the first few milliseconds that started out as really really slow, or really low volume, but suddenly we essentially hit what is a wall of data. And you could have the best predictive models available across the street. If you are still processing the first bit of this pretty much tidal wave, and everybody else has already completed everything, your insight is going to be wasted. So with this, essentially we'll cover uh, the first optimization, which is how can we receive large amounts of data from the network in something that is somewhat efficient. And just to stress again, this is not specific to uh, HFTs as a whole. Um, the things that we'll cover here are applicable to a vast uh, variety of projects. So for example, if you were writing like a client from an MMORPG or something along those lines, you'd be able to use some of the things that, that we'll cover. So this is going to be essentially a, an overview of how we receive data from the network and how we make this available to user-like processes. It's a simplified view, we won't dwell into some of the I guess, uh, complexities or some of the deeper optimizations that are available. Um, but primarily, if you're using like a mainline Linux kernel, there are certain things that uh, you get by default, and some of those optimizations are often not part of them. So those are things that you have to add uh, on top of this. So when you have your, your network card, you're listening to incoming data on the wire, you usually, um, that data sort of comes into the network card, and that gets placed into a, a pico queue. So that's, again, specifically internal to the network card. Now at some point, the network card will decide that, hey, I had enough data, or maybe um, 
There's no way to read data, and it will copy that data to main memory. Now, the thing that's important to note here is that this will use direct memory access. You are totally bypassing the CPU. You are purely copying data from the network card into the main memory. So, so far, so good. Now, however, at that point, the network card needs to let somebody know that there's data that needs to be processed. And the way that usually happens is via an interrupt. And if core one, um, in that particular case, is currently computing some predictive price um, that core or that process will be interrupted. Now, at that point, we will switch essentially into kernel mode, and the kernel thread will copy the data from the receiving buffer from the network card back into a socket buffer. So, same data, just slightly different location. Now, at some point, you're going to make essentially what is a system call to read that data from the socket buffer into user land. And that means, again, that you will have to marshal things in and out of, of, uh, of kernel mode, and you will interrupt whatever processes are running on, on core 1. So that's not terribly efficient, uh, and there's a couple of reasons why that's the case. The first one, obviously, is that interrupts cause delay, and you have something known as interrupt coalescing, and that really means that instead of you being notified every time you get a package on the network, um, we will sort of call back interrupts in a bunch until we have enough data for the kernel to process. So we're sort of buffering the updates until we think that the buffer is full enough, and then we're letting you know. So at that point, um, essentially, you've already missed out on the sensitivity of, of data. Second, obviously, is that system calls are expensive. Um, when you have to marshal things in and out or switch into kernel mode, that causes delays. And finally, and perhaps obviously, we've just copied the data between times, which clearly isn't great. So can we do better? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, there is a technique called kernel bypass. I don't know how many of you. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Even the people who watched that talk last year, I didn't search for that job. Sure. Okay, never mind. Um, so, kernel bypass essentially means you still have the, the data coming into your FIFO queue on your network card, and it still gets put into main memory. But, 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 and this is the important bit the kernel is not aware of that receiving buffer. Essentially, in that username process on core one, which could be the thing computing your predictive model, you are spinning on the memory location in the RX buffer. You do not need to switch to kernel mode, you do not need to have any expensive system calls, you absolutely do not need to shuffle that data three times. Now, is there a downside to it? Um, the answer is yes. So, this is a technique that is specific, specifically tied to the type of network card. Um, that you are using. So that could be vendor specific as well as version specific to the network app itself. You might think that's not really a problem, but when you deal with thousands of machines or tens of thousands of machines, you might end up in a situation whereby you get machine failure. And the replacement that you get, if that somehow differs from the part that you've written the code for, you're pretty much toast and you have to go back to option one, which is a slow option. But if you have a good you know, inventory control and supply chain logistics, then maybe that's not so much that you have to worry about. Cool. So the second bit is looking at the CPU and memory interaction. So this is like a, again, a very simplistic higher view of um, like a caching hierarchy on the CPU. You have registers directly on the CPU chip itself, uh, along with some of like, the M1 caches, all the way down to main memory. And I should add this is not too scary. So on the left-hand side, you have an idea of the size. Registers typically will hold around 64 bit. And as you drop down the hierarchy, you have more and more space available to you. Now, obviously, that comes as a cost. And the cost is the number of cycles required to access that data. And you can see from the right hand side, registers pretty much instantaneous. But as you hit main memory, that's essentially 250 cycles, roughly. Now, given that a modern binary is quite easy in the hundreds of megabytes, the way that you sort of interact and the way that you have to condense the data um, is really important. What's also the purpose, I guess, of correctness? Um, cache is usually divided into two sections. You have an instruction cache as well as a data cache, but we sort of put those in the form in this talk. So this is essentially the first optimization that you can look at, essentially grouping things that you are going to access together, together. Um, and let's see why that's the case. So this is a, like a, a toy example, but we have a struct with three 32 bit uh, fields, code tokens, and options. And below, we have um, I guess a, a set of code that accesses one of those fields. 
Now, in my memory, um, your strategy sort of lined up continuously. Um, you didn't really need to worry about this. You sort of test that. Now, the first time you assess the proto-Russian field on your struct, um, let's assume you get the caches. So you have nothing available in your cache. And what you end up doing is essentially is fetching things into my memory. Now, the best way to sort of think about this is if your memory is like this massive, I don't know, bookshelf, your cache lines are essentially rows with little boxes. Now, in those boxes, you can fit values, like a 32-bit um, field. But more importantly, when you fetch a single book from memory or a single value from memory, you don't just get that book. You get enough to fill essentially the entire cache line for free. That's, you don't need to worry about it. You don't need to do anything about it. So very smart people, much smarter than I, um, ended up implementing this at a hardware level. So here in this example, if we assume a cache line that can hold two 32 bits um, values, we end up getting proto version and timestamp. That's how this good. But here comes the issue. When we try to access the options field, that field has not been loaded into the cache. That field is still in main memory. And what that field means is that at some point, you are going to invalidate the cache line. So you're going to have to eject something from the cache, something that you might need later, to go fetch the field in my memory. And the simple way to go work around this way is to be really much cognizant of the fact that fields that are accessed together should be stored together. And here, the only thing that, the only difference that you made is simply reorder the field in the struct. Like, your code doesn't change, other than the placement of the fields in the struct. And this time, when you go to main memory to fill the cache line, you grab the version, but again, you want to fill the whole cache line, you grab the thing adjacent to it, and this time, instead of it being garbage, it's stuff that you're actually using. Cool. Now, another optimization uh, we briefly touched upon, which can be a bit counterintuitive at first, is actually that uh, storing things as pointers and the fact that you have to dereference pointers can be very, very expensive. So here's like a, another for example. Uh, we have a struct arc and we have a vector of pointers. Now, the vectors are uh, the values are stored in a contiguous memory location, so that's great. We don't need to worry about that. And that means that as we iterate through those pointers, essentially, we have all of those available in our cache. So far, so good. But here comes the issue. We're going to have to dereference that pointer to access some of the fields. And again, back to what is the, the first part of this talk, we are going to grab the field that we want along with a ton of garbage, so stuff that we don't necessarily need. At all. And not only that, we are going to do this at every single iteration. So as we iterate through those pointers, we need to be referenced, we need to fetch the field from main memory, we need to evict something from our cache to fill it with essentially a little bit of what we want and a lot of what we don't need. So how do we address this? Well, actually, instead of storing pointers, we can store actual objects. And that sounds simple, but that makes a huge difference. So sure, as you start iterating through things, uh, you won't be able to fit the whole vector into your cache most likely. But that's all right, because every time you need to access a field, and especially if you have like, a node termination clause in your loop, um, you will do because every attribute on that object is going to be already available to you in cache plot. Cool. So quick summary. Um, performance is great, but it's a little bit of a Kind of difficult to pin down. I think it means different things to different people. It can feel as something that's relatively subjective. So the way around this really is to have monitoring in place. So some of that is essentially real-time monitoring, but more importantly, you need to have some baselines. And what that really means is as you iterate, as you deploy code, as you run code, you need to have a good sense of what performance you can expect. So on the Linux, uh, there's a tool called Perl. That's pretty much the go-to tool for uh, a lot of that. It will allow you to generate flame graphs, which are really good at uh, pointing hot zones. It will give you things like um, cache pieces, branch mix predictions, and the like, uh, and all of that essentially comes for free. So S trace is what we would use to um, understand syscalls. So syscalls will imply uh, switching to uh, into the operating system into kernel mode, uh, and those are obviously quite expensive. So from that perspective, if you start seeing a lot of say reads happening. That's usually a good indication that you want to uh, pre-check the data. Cool. But uh, those were very, very much generic, so many are doing the last. And now let me take it a step further to the next case. So, 
Uh, all right, so this is me. My name's Nani. I'm a FPGA developer for HRT, Hudson River Trading. Um, just a bit of a background about myself. Um, I come from UNSW University, which is in Sydney, Australia, if you heard about it. I've got a Bachelor in Telecommunications, which is really just a fancy name to Bachelor of, um, of Electrical Engineering with a couple of courses in networks and mobile phones. Uh, I've got a Master's in Electronics, so Microelectronics. Um, I did teach classes at UNSW in digital design, so things like um, digital electronics, uh, microelectronics, embedded system, and so on. Um, I worked for the university for a few years, and then I kind of quit because I had enough of engineering, and I became a personal trainer because that's what you do, and engineering is not life, right? That's right. Uh, so I was doing this for a while, and then um, about some while later, um, this company, this um, finance company, the trading company in Sydney came up to me and said, hey, Noni, come and work for us. And I'm like, nah, I'm, I'm a personal trainer now. And then we sat down and talked, and I was like, wait, what? You're gonna pay me how much? So here we are. Um, since then, I worked for uh, four different trading companies, a couple in Sydney, a couple here in Singapore, um, and now I'm in um, HRT. One little fun fact about me is that I do have a lot of Lego in the house. I don't know why Meadows but I'm not allowed to buy any more Legos because there's nowhere to put it anymore. All right, so that, that's about me. But let's talk about why we're here. Um, so we were talking about like trading systems and you know, you want to make it really, really fast. And when you come to build a trading system or any system in general, but I care about trading, um, what are your options? Well, classic, in, in classic um, system, we used to uh, use software to program computers, so CPUs, GPUs are now taking um, a new kind of like stance because of AI and that's a new buzzword. Um, and it's really easy, I, I assume a lot of you are computer science engineers, software engineers, so on. Um, so you know, C, C++, whatever your coding language is, really easy to develop for their CPU. But on the complete other side, we have ASICs, Application Specific Integrated Circuit, which is just a fancy word for like microchips. So the computer processor in your computer is a microchip, whatever's in your iPhone is an ASIC, anything that's like a chip that's been burned, the silicon's been burned, and this is your system. This is like extremely fast. The problem with ASICs is that they are really, really expensive, and it takes a really long time to develop for them. Because you only have one chance. Once you embedded your ASIC there and pay like, I don't know, $50 million, I'm not even joking, that's it, you don't get another chance. FPGA is a somewhere in between. FPGAs are a programmable chip, if you want. It's kind of like an ASIC that I can reflash again and again. Uh, if I made a mistake, I can just do it again. So it's not like programming a computer. There's no ALU inside. There's no like a, a logic unit that just process commands. It's the actual gates, the actual logic gates that we build where we can reprogram them. How many of you have actually heard of FPGAs before? Okay, my job here is done, really. Have you, is this something to teach you here at the university? I, I don't actually know, no? Just kind of hobby? Okay, nice. Let's see what I um, what can give you there. So if you heard about FPGAs, I assume you know in your studies about logic gates, Boolean gates, and or not gates, all sorts of stuff like this, yeah? All right, good, that's half the job done. Um, what is an FPGA? Let's give you a bit of a picture there. So, well, that doesn't show you much. Usually when I have like an actual design tool, I can zoom in and actually show the inside. But I can describe what's going on. This is a chip, this is the FPGA. Most of the FPGA, you can think about it as logic gate, and or not gates are just kind of floating in space and we have like thousands, hundreds of thousands of them, of those gates. And when we want to make a design, we use our CAD tools and we wire those gates together in order to create a circuit, what we want. So it's kind of like making a chip, but we can do it again and again and again. Now I said there's like logic gates in there and or not gates, not completely true. There's what's called, um, uh, what are they called? Uh, lookup tables, LUTs, lookup tables. They're kind of like truth tables and it's little functions of usually up to say six variables. So you have like special gates, special functions, six variables, you have a lot of uh, flexibility in there. So to simplify it, you can think about it just as logic gate and or gates. Uh, and with those gates, we can build anything we want. But there's some functions that we are very, very common that we want to use in FPGAs. 
Um, so they do have some specific blocks on the FPGAs, not a lot, but there's few, few of them like the transceivers. FPGAs we want to talk about to the network. The network runs at like 10 gigabits per second, 100 gigabits per second. It's really, really high circuitry. You can't just build it with end or gates just flying there. So there's some special circuitry for that. We also have some memory. Obviously, you need memory for most applications. There's dedicated memories all over the place. Um, DSP blocks, DSP, digital signal processing, fancy word for multipliers, really. So we do a lot of mathematics, arithmetics. You have special blocks for this. And IO pins, you have, if you want to connect to external peripherals to the FPGA, they allow you to do that as well. So why would we want to use an FPGA? Or where would we want to use an FPGA? So you can't just take any algorithm that you have and then shove it into the FPGA. It does take a little bit more effort to program an FPGA, or to design for an FPGA, than just writing a C program, or go to a bit Python program. Program? Python. Um, you're gonna wanna do s specific stuff for the FPGA. You wanna use an algorithm that's stable and well-known, something that you might have tested in software already. You know that it's working, okay, let's dedicate time to push on the FPGA. If I'm dedicating time to do it, I want it to be latency critical. I want the speed gain that I'm gonna get from using the hardware to be worth it. Otherwise, why not use a software if it's not a critical path? And it says hardware implementation is nice. So nice means you don't want something with too many special cases. You don't wanna have like circuitry for this special case and circuitry for this special case. You try to generalize your algorithm so all the data flow go through the same circuitry as much as you can. I mean, the special case everywhere, so that's kind of what it means, plain nice. Now, Pierre before talked about uh, network cards. So this is like a revision from what Pierre talked about. And this was the case where we had the kernel bypass. So imagine you have network data coming into your um, network card. So that's the NIC over there. The NIC takes the data, converts into buffers it up, takes the whole packet, sends it to the memory. So have a one copy, pings the CPU, say, hey, we've got some data for you take another copy of this um, packet, throw it into the CPU. This is great, really easy to work. I'm, I'm sure most of you have done socket programming, really open socket, there's my data, don't need to worry about it. But in reality, what happens? We copy the data a few times. We have to wait for the packet to come in until the whole thing is there. We can do better than this. And I'll show you how in a second. When we're talking about trading system, this is again something that Pierre showed you is in general, this is what we do in HRT, we get data from the market, so from the exchange to see what's happening. We're gonna convert it into our own special uh, propriety program, uh, propriety format, so all of our processes can understand it. We then use the algorithms to you know, come up with good trades. We come up with our internal trade message, convert it back to the specific exchange, send it out, hopefully make some money out of this. <laughs> But all these conversions and using you know, computers takes time. If we had an FPGA, where would we put it? We'll put it right there. We're gonna skip this entire loop and we're gonna write a special FPGA that understand this specific exchange format. Already know how to use it, calculates all the signals inside the algorithm and shoot it right back to the market. And we gain tens of microseconds. And microseconds is a very long time in, mar in trading world. When you go down to FPGAs or to chips, we're talking about like nanoseconds accuracy. So you try to sort of get really, really, really fast. So this is where like FPGAs fit in the picture. The downside of this is that you have to write a design specific for every exchange. Because every exchange speaks a different format, every exchange takes back a different format, but the gains that you get from this optimization, gains mean money, is a lot, worth the time for most of the stuff. So if I wanted to receive a packet, this is kind of like going back to the example of receiving a network packet in the FPGA. I can, incoming data is the, is the line that comes, you know, the, the network line or uh, that comes from the wall, from the, from the router. And it goes through our FPGA's receiver. What happens there is that we actually gain the data as it comes in, as the bytes bits, as the bits come in through the wire, we can already process them. So our transceivers in the FPGA usually convert the, you know, the bits come one by one in a very, very fast rate, 10 gigabits per second, sometimes 100 gigabits per second. 
We convert them into parallel words. To make it easier, we can think that we get four bytes or eight bytes at a time. We can work with uh, four bytes. So you can imagine a packet that's coming four bytes at a time. We process this. If it's a UDP packet, it goes through, like, you know, we, we, we read the bytes as they come in. We strip the MAC header, we strip the IP and UDP header. And then we can have all these different consumers. This is all on the FPGA that might do different things with our packet. And they all run in parallel. Each one of them is a circuit, a piece of circuit that kind of sits there and it can um, process your data in parallel. So those filters say, all right, I care about this packet. I don't care about this packet. Let me process this. Uh, so just a fluff slide to tell you how um, a, a trader on a chip looks like. Incoming packet comes in. We pass the packet. The strategy, what we said before, this is like the, the brains. There's probably a lot of data, so we need some off-chip memory to remember all this data. We come up with some nice predictions to what it's going to look like. We build the order that we're going to send to the exchange. Then there's this risk thing. The risk thing is uh, it's a little block that we have in trading systems that say, hey, do you even have enough money to buy whatever you're trying to buy there? Or is this too much risk for us to go for this trade? Maybe we're going to break up the company. In my previous company, we've actually done this. Because somebody thought it was going to be a good trade. They asked the other guy, hey, can you lift the risk just for this one? The company almost went bankrupt. I'm not even joking. We didn't, we didn't know if we are going to have a job the next day. Don't, don't eliminate the risk. And then it goes back to the exchange. Hopefully make money. Uh, all right, this to summarize everything I said. So, you know, FPGAs, it's all parallel computing because it's a chip. You can do whatever you want on the chip. Uh, however, a bit softer on speed goes without saying. Um, only for the correct problems. If you like to do everything yourself, I do like to do everything myself. I get in trouble with my teammates sometimes. But, you know, this is nature of a lone engineer. Now the interesting bit. So how, how do we actually program FPGAs? So we have what's called hardware description languages. So you know you have programming languages for CPUs. In hardware, you have hardware description languages. They kind of look like programming languages. We, we do sit there in front of like, I don't know, VS Code or whatever your favorite editor is and write designs. But they're not quite programming languages. They're, again, they're HDLs. Everything that we write is in parallel. And this is the biggest thing I always try to convey across to software engineers. Whatever you write there is not going to run in sequence. It's not like this command will run here, then this one, then this one, or we're going to have a branch to this place. No, everything that you write, it doesn't matter what order you put it in. Everything runs in parallel. And it makes sense because it's chip, it's, like, it's, it's, it's circuits that are just sitting there. Whether they activate or not, who cares? They're there. They must be there if you want to have the operation. So there's two main HDL languages uh, in the world, VHDL and Verilog. VHDL, so the HDL and VHDL stands for, you know, how to script language. The V stands for very high speed integrated circuit. That's the V in HDL. Uh, both languages are very well defined in the IEEE standards. Uh, they both do the very same thing, they just have different synthesis. Um, you can choose, people usually have a favorite one or another. Um, some companies prefer one or another. Uh, sometimes you just learn one or another, but they do the same thing. The tools that we use for FPGAs, they all pretty much support both languages, so it doesn't matter which one we, you want to use. There's about 50, 50 split in the industry between two languages. Um, today we're going to talk about Verilog because VHD is garbage and it should not be used. <laughs> Um, in fact, there's, there's Verilog, which is the original language, and nowadays we actually use something called System Verilog, which is kind of like the C++ to C. It's kind of like Verilog on steroids. It's the, it's the bigger uh, Verilog. But what I show you, what I want to do today is just show you some examples of what Verilog actually looks like, what a description language it looks like. It's going to be a very, very small subset. I'm just going to go through a few elements of Verilog. Uh, you're not going to become an expert after this. Uh, it's just a bit of an example. So let, let's, let's do it by an example of adding two numbers. So just before I do, um, has, are you familiar with the terms full header, full, full headers and half headers? Some of the, yeah, some, yes, no, okay. Um, 
So, so here what I'm kind of showing you, you probably figured out, I'm adding two 8 bits number, that's the two 8 bits there. Um, and this is like long addition, just like you would do in your um, decimal numbers, you can do this thing in binary. So you add, you know, the, the two digits, the two bits on the right, you get a sum, you get a carry, then you add all three of those bits, you get a sum, you get a carry, and so on. Um, if, for those who are not familiar, half, half adder is a circuit that takes two bits, so two inputs, and then adds them together and outputs a sum of the two bits and if there's a carry out. That's a half adder. A full adder is very similar, only takes three inputs. So it takes the carry in from the previous stage, um, the bit from one number, the bit for the other number, and then it adds them together, you get you the sum and the carry out. Let me show you how it looks like. So this is this is a circuit for um, half adder, for, sorry, for full full adder, and this circuit represents one slice of the eight bits that I want to have there. So I'm going to need eight of those in order to actually build my eight bits adder. And how it's going to work? I'm going to take a full adder, take two bits, the carry in, then the sum of the first bit is going to come out. I'm going to propagate the carry out back to the carry in of the next one. The sum is going to come out, and so on. Does this make sense? It's pretty straightforward. Yeah. All right, good. Um, one thing to notice here, by the way, that when you make your circuit more and more, like larger and larger, so if you have more than eight bits, if you have 16 bits, or if you want to add to 64 bits, this carry chain starts becoming really, really long because you always need to rely on the carry from the previous stage before you move to the next one. So that's something to observe. So how do we actually build this thing in um, very long? So let's start with building a full error. And this is what Verilog looks like. Verilog is a hierarchical language. So you build little modules. Modules are kind of like black boxes with inputs and outputs. Kind of like each one of those is a black box. We have some inputs, we have some outputs. It's defined as a module. You can see that I'm defining three inputs, and I say that they are of type wire. So wire is a data type. A, B, so one bit, the second bit, and the carry in. And the outputs from this black box is the one bit sum and the one bit carry out. Now, just a little bit about formatting, uh, about syntax. So in the language, I define internal wire. So you can see in the circuit, I have those points, x, y, and z that are sort of intermediate points in my circuit. So I define them as Y, that, that's, I, I can name them. Then you can see those XOR and XOR and OR over there. These are all modules on their own. They're, they're built-in modules, but they are also modules. So they're little black boxes that take inputs and outputs and the, you know, in the parenthesis, the convention is that the one um, output port is the first out, is the first parameter and then whatever inputs you have, follow this. So for example, that X or PX, I'll say something about the PX in a second. So the output is gonna be X, take the two inputs A and B, and X or them together. And you can, you can see where it's in the diagram over there. Uh, the thing with the PX, PY, PZ, sum and carry, these are just labels. These are the names of the instance of the module. Because for example, you can see I have two different end modules there. One is called PY, one is called PZ. This is for me later when I analyze this to tell the difference when I, when I look later at the biggest circuit, uh, which end gate am I talking about? So it's just giving it a name. It's, it, you, can, you can call them whatever you want. I call them P for point, point X, point Y, point Z, and then the sum and the carry. And this whole thing is my one slice full error. So this is like one of those. Now I want to build up to make it um, 8 bits adder. So I'm going to build another module, 8 bits adder. Now, a bit of um, syntax over there. You can see that 7 colon 0. So you can kind of imagine these are kind of like arrays. We call them vectors in very long. And we symbolize the indices of the vectors. We, we say it as if um, we call it 7 down to 0. So 7 is the most significant bit. Zero is the significant bit. Few things that you can do in Verilog that you cannot do in things like C. 
I'm not limited to start my counting from zero. I can have my array going 15 to seven, 15 to eight, 15 down to eight. Uh, most significant bit is 15, this significance is eight, just because I want to. And you can see that that's what I'm doing there, uh, uh, over there, seven down to minus one. Yes, we can have negative um, array indices or vector indices, no problem. We can also switch the order around. I can, instead of doing seven down to zero, I can say zero up to seven. Most significant bit will be number zero. This significant will be seven. Uh, this is kind of convention, but you can play around with this. So this is just a little bit about the syntax. You can see that I defined a whole bunch of wires um, that for the carry out. And there's this keyword assign. So what I'm saying there, assign is called continuous assignment. I'm saying the carry in from stage minus zero, whatever's coming from nowhere, I'm continuously assigning it to zero. And you read the syntax, one bit of zero, or one binary bit of zero. This is how you write numbers in variables. And then the rest of it is kind of makes sense. I'm instantiating eight of those full headers from over there, and I'm connecting a zero, you know, it's, it's kind of an array or vector, A zero, B zero, the carry from the previous stage, which is why I had to use the carry from minus one, and then the sums out there. And if you think about it, it's all kind of cascade together. Um, and then you connect your eight bits for errors. One thing that I want to emphasize uh, that I said before, I can write those lines in any order that I want. They don't have to come in this order. I can shuffle those lines around. It'll be exactly the same circuit because everything happens in parallel. It's all just there. It's all just like a black box that, that it lays down circuitry for you. And it figures out all the implicit connections from the wire names. But writing them one by one by one by one, it's a little bit annoying. Kind of silly if I wanted to do like you know 128 bits so I'm copy and pasting we can use uh, a for loop so it looks very similar to C or Java uh, for zero to you know less than eight and then instantiate those full headers again and again and again you can play around with this number eight to as many as you want you can see those keywords begin and end they're very they're the same as the curly brackets that we have in other languages in very long it's called begin and end so that's one way of, you know, just compacting our circuit a little bit. Don't worry too much about the word generate. They kind of eliminated it in system very well because it's in superior language. So that's another way to compact our, our code. Can we compact it even more? Yes, of course we can. I mean, why, why write our own circuit? Like, you, you just tell system very well, the sum equals A plus B, can you do it for me? And system very well, we go like, yes, here it is. Um, the reason why I went through all this example is just because I wanted to show you the format, the syntax, but really we can do a lot of like really powerful things like addition in very low. So that's one side of this. Uh, before I go to the next slide, I just want to show you that so this assign, I said it's a continuous assignment. If the wires A and B change their value as time goes past, so A and B can go like 0, 1, 0, 1, then the sum S will immediately get the value. It will update continuously as the inputs change. But in reality, we have what's called um, synchronous circuits. We have the concept of a clock coming in, you know, in your computer, you know, your computer is like, I don't know, five gigahertz these days, I don't know, who uses computers? Um, it's all cloud computing, right? Um, so for synchronous circuits, we need to start adding memory elements. And here's a clock down there. A clock is just a square wave. It goes up and down, up and down in a certain frequency. This circuit is called a D flip flop. A flip flop is a little piece of um, a black box that remembers one bit. So it stores one bit in it every time the clock goes up. up. So every time this arrow on the rising edge of the clock connected there, it will sample the input D, and it will remember it, and it will hold this value until the next rising edge of the clock. That's a simple flip-flop. Then we have things like reset and enable. Reset, if you, if you assert reset, if you turn reset up, on, then you will just ignore whatever's on D, and you will um, reset the value of the flip-flop to zero. And then we have an enable that says, on this rising edge of the clock, 
if it's not enabled, just ignore the hold on to whatever value you have inside. It's just little things you can add to your flip book. How would we write something like this in Verilog? This is some new keywords for you as well. So we have all the inputs and outputs. We have this keyword called always at. So always at positive edge of the clock, positive edge of clock, which kind of what I said, whenever the clock goes up, do this. And you can see we do have an if statement, it's kind of, kind of like how we had four, you have if statement as well. And we say, well, there's three conditions. We said, if the reset is turned on, we want to reset the, the, the flip book. So first of all, check if reset is on. If it is, then the output Q should go to zero. If it's not, then are we enabled? Is enable asserted? If it is, then take the input D, put it to Q. If not, then just don't do anything. You know, just remember what's going on. Now, one last thing. You can see this funny less than or equal sign here instead of just like, you know, the equal sign that you expect. This is something that most programming languages don't have. This is unique to HDLs. This is what we call non-blocking assignments. So if we, if we didn't have the little less than sign, it's called blocking assignments. This says non-blocking assignments. I don't want to go into too many details, but there's a big difference between them. Just so you know, for sequential circuits, things with clock, we usually use non-blocking assignments, which is just this sign over there. Hi. Hello, guys. Uh, hope the dinner was good. Um, anyway, uh, for our second talk today, we have Ambrose, who is going to be talking about Kubernetes. Did I get that right? Okay. Yep. All right, so let's give him a round of applause, please. Hello. So, my name is Ambrose. Uh, I'm going to talk about Kubernetes. It's simpler than you think. Uh, this is an introduction, quick introduction to Kubernetes. Uh, so about a, bit, a little about me, uh, my handle everywhere as server went down, uh, because if one server goes down and the other servers are still, um, and the application still works, then you're doing something right. Uh, so I was originally from a new time, and uh, did three years of cyber NSF, uh, doing cyber security, uh, and then I went on to a health startup. Now I'm a software engineer at Microsoft, working on an intrusion detection system. Uh, for IoT. Uh, I love strictly type languages like Rust, TypeScript, uh, and Python, type Python. Uh, in my spare time, I, I, I contribute to open source projects sometimes and experiment on my home lab. Yes. Okay, so here's, some, here's the overview I'll be going through today. Uh, I'll go through a little summary of what is Kubernetes uh, and the background on, some background on containers, scaling application, and how I, Kubernetes is, uh, why I think Kubernetes is a robot, a scheduler and a network, uh, give some re reasons when to use Kubernetes and when not to use Kubernetes. I also do a little demo of, uh, running, uh, of running a Docker Compose application uh, in Kubernetes. Uh, finally, I'll go talk about a lot of alternatives to Kubernetes, and that's it. Yeah, so a quick summary of what is Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes automates deployment of your application. Uh, it manages your application as containers. So if you have a Docker container, you want to run it on, uh, on the cloud or on your own infrastructure, you can use Kubernetes to achieve that. Uh, you can also deploy your application on the uh, cloud, on your own hardware, using Kubernetes, uh, as you wish. Uh, it helps you do that. It's designed after, by Google after their internal deployment system called Borg, uh, which runs all, of their, runs all of Google's containers in their own hardware. So here's a little background on containers. Uh, so, for typically when you run an application during development or you're deploying it to a small environment, uh, you, want to run it on, you may want to run it on one machine or maybe a few machines. Uh, you have your machine connected to the internet. Yeah, so you have your machine connected to the internet, you have some applications, uh, and you have your application uh, be listening on a certain port, maybe in this case, port 80. 8080. Uh, then your application will connect to local host to your, on the same host, on the same machine, to the database and to the cache. Maybe you have that on your application. So in containerized deployment, it's, very, it's quite straightforward. Uh, what you have is, instead of the application listening on the machine, running on the machine, it runs inside a container. Uh, so the, whenever you have a request that comes in, uh, you hit the machine. The machine may port forward it to your 
application within the container. So it rewrites the address. So instead of going to the machine's IP address, it will redirect it uh, port to port forwarding to the container's IP address. So here it is 10.202. <coughs> and then your application then can then talk to your database, which may be is also in the on the same machine but running in a container. And how it does that is using the IP address of the database container. And the same goes for the cache. So in, from a networking perspective, uh, if, done com uh, if you study computer networks, uh, this is what it would somewhat, this is a summarized diagram of what it would look like. So your host, which is your machine's operating system, is connected to the internet. And you have a, another, and it's also connected to the container network, uh, which, which is connected to your three containers here. Uh, the host has an IP address for the internet, an IP address for the container network, and each container has its own IP address. And really, the host, the container just looks like another uh, machine that's uh, running uh, your operating system, your uh, system uh, binaries, your etc. So, so here's like here's uh, here's the left. It's on my host machine. Uh, this is my IP. Uh, this is the IP addresses on my machine. And then on the right is the IP address in the container. So here it's the sign. My host has a. So that's how it does routing. So it will route from the host network to the uh, container network uh, using this IP address. <coughs> so from a systems perspective, this is somewhat what it looks like. Uh, so usually you run your applications. This is how you do it without containers. You run your applications on the host operating system. Uh, you have your binaries on the host operating system. Uh, and then your application would then run using maybe, for example, you have your application written in Python, you need the uh, Python binaries, and they'll run on your host operating system. However, in a containerized environment, the, the, you use the container runtime to run your container, uh, to run your container. <coughs> so you have binaries, for example, if you have Python, you can run one Python application here, and one Node.js application here, and one can be running Ubuntu, one can be running Debian, one can be running Fedora. Uh, and they are all running within the container runtime on the host operating system. <coughs> so it's a very, containers is a way to like abstract away uh, the uh, programs that are running on the host and provide an isolated environment. <coughs> so typically, now you have your containerized application. So how you scale it usually, is maybe you'd have, so this is the diagram of previously. Each of this is a container. Uh, maybe on a scale it, first you maybe introduce like application, multiple application threads. Uh, so uh, I have multiple con application containers here, uh, labeled thread one, thread two, thread three. Uh, that's if your application cannot do threading on its own. Uh, so then whenever a request comes in, you can direct it to one of these application instances. And then the application will talk to the database and tab also. Or maybe you want to scale even further, maybe you have multiple machines now, so you need a load balancer in front of all these machines. Uh, and then uh, you maybe you scale even more, and then you face the problem of like, if I have so many machines, how do I manually manage all of these machines? Like, do I have to SSH into each one, set up the application, uh, set up the containers, Docker up, and then also then you face the problem of how do you connect all of these machines together in a secure way and with, uh, and for them, you all communicate with each other through, uh, through the common network. So first, I'll show you why Kubernetes is a robot. So Kubernetes is a robot, not really, but Kubernetes applies the control loops to a, like the control loop pattern usually found in robotics to a cluster of machines, just like a robot would use control loops to move its parts. So <coughs> this is the core foundation of how Kubernetes is built. So in a in the control loop, you usually have a set point. You say I want I you say and you usually have a set point, uh, and you have a controller, actuator, the environment, and then that feedback that feeds back to the sensor, and then it goes back to the controller, actuator, environment, sensor, and this is a loop that performs a, a typical robotics control loop has. So an example would be uh, the, for example you have a, you're gonna move a robotic arm. So you'd say that I wanted the angle to be like 90 degrees. <clears throat> uh, maybe the current arm angle is 45 degrees. So you move, uh, the control will know that difference. You move at the right speed. Uh, it will impose an action on the arm controller. Set a command to the arm, arm motor. And then the arm will move. And then the 
arm angle will be measured by the arm angle sensor, and then you then uh, so on and so forth through this loop. So in communities, uh, it, the principles are the core principles are the same. Uh, you have a resource specification. You say what what do I want to run on this? Uh, what infrastructure do I want to run? And then you then you tell Kubernetes controller that. Uh, and then create commands to uh, create the processes in your operating system, or like create a load balancer in the cloud, or create new uh, anything actually, uh, virtual machines, etc. <coughs> you can also do that. Uh, then after that, the operating system will then maybe like be measured. So you'd say that oh, I'm now running these processes, and they'll be measured by the sensor. And then Kubernetes would then look at the difference. If there's still something that's not running, it can then go and reevaluate that. Uh, and go through this control loop. <coughs> so this is an example of what a uh, Kubernetes resource is. So here we have the three parts. The key, the first bit is the control is the controller's identity. So here we say we want a deployment. It defines it really defines the intention that you want. So if I want to deploy an application, I use a deployment. If I want to deploy a service, Make it accessible. I'll use like a service or ingress. <coughs> and in the next section, we have metadata, uh, which are identifiers to like identify this resource, and the, so that Kubernetes will know that if you have another resource with the same name and label with the same name, it will make sure that it doesn't create duplicate resources. <coughs> and then also we have finally the specification, which is really like how in the control loop uh, design is really the set point. So that's what you want to, uh, what this resource should look like. You specify as in the specification. So <coughs> here, here I have three replicas. I want three replicas, and I want a template uh, uh, to run. I want to run these containers, uh, the Nginx container version one twenty five two, and it also has just describing the port of the application, so I can use later on. <coughs> this is how a resource looks like. So. Uh, finally, so we've got this deployment resource. Uh, here's a simplified model of it. Uh, so what, how, why, how Kubernetes is a scheduler is that Kubernetes controllers, uh, which are what runs on Kubernetes, uh, they, they can create external resources, such as running containers or like cloud load balancers, like I mentioned. So, and they also can create other Kubernetes resources, critically. This is, this effect, this is how a lot of Kubernetes Built to abstractions. So, <coughs> in the first side, we have the deployment. Uh, it says that, why well, I mentioned this now, uh, and we have a replica set that is produced from the deployment. So, when you when you tell Kubernetes I want this deployment, it will create this replica set, and then it will create these three pods. So, pods are what Kubernetes uses to run uh, uses to run containers on the uh, on your machines. Uh, so Kubernetes pods are sh scheduled based on the best matching node, based on the availability of memory, CPU, pod count, and other properties. So if you have three machines and they all run Kubernetes, they will schedule the pod on the machine uh, that is the best matching one that has least load, for example, and it will run there as a container. Uh, so in Kubernetes terminology, pods are almost the same as containers. Uh, there's some detail to that, but I won't go into it. <coughs> so one thing useful about this pattern of uh, being, being able to uh, have, have why? <coughs> so one thing useful about this pattern of uh, why a Kubernetes can create other Kubernetes resources, which then create other Kubernetes resources, is in for the case of an upgrade. So if you have a version of software. Uh, the version of Nginx, uh, now it's currently 1.52. And let's suppose I want to upgrade it. So what I'll do is I'll create, I'll update the deployment. I can go in and edit in the communities. The deployment can say I want Nginx uh, 1.60. Uh, communities will then go in and immediately create a replica set, uh, a new replica set object with this upgraded version. Uh, so now there's this other replica set with three replicas. And because that replica set exists now in Kubernetes, Kubernetes will then look at the replica set and say, oh, I need three replicas of this version. So then we'll create three pods of that specific uh, uh, of that image. 
And then after that, the deployment actually is, well, well then you notice that, oh, there's three replicas now of that replica set. The replica set is ready. So then it will remove, update the other replica set, the older version of the replica set, to say that I want zero replicas. Then, then it will go ahead and uh, delete every port one by one. <coughs> and then finally, when the deployment is done, it will then delete the old replica set. And so this is how you do an upgrade. And notice that throughout this, you still have pods that are running, uh, running while the upgrade is in progress. So this is how Kubernetes achieves some of its uh, high availability. So you can still have your application assess your application. Uh, thirdly, I'll go through how Kubernetes is a network. So every Kubernetes pods are all connected to the same network. Uh, so you have a Kubernetes guarantees that you have a a single network that all pods are connected to and across all machines. And every pod must be able to communicate with each other. That's a uh, guarantee that Kubernetes provides. <coughs> so for example, how you run your the application I showed previously is you uh, is you just run them on the machines. They'll all be connected to each other automatically through the network. And then you can do load balancing, for example, to share to distribute your traffic across the application. So this is this is what it looks like if you want to scale up to more machines. So you then have the uh, internet. Uh, so whenever some request comes in, you just need to load balance to one of your application instances. Your application can connect to the database through Kubernetes network. <coughs> so one, one really good reason, reason to use Kubernetes is when you have a small but experienced team and need to scale infrastructure beyond your teams can manage. So usually when you have like a small startup, uh, with, but with many users and you want to scale your infrastructure, this is uh, Kubernetes is useful. Uh, also, when you need like highly available uh, or have like SLAs to provide like a certain service to someone, to a customer, <coughs> and also when you need like a scheduler to just run jobs for you, and you don't want to care about where it's running, you don't want to manage the uh, worker nodes, uh, you just want to say I want to run this application, and then it will just run it for you, and you can then. Uh, ignore the managing of the machines themselves. And also, <coughs> uh, you can use Kubernetes when you are, you, yeah, when you really, really don't like managing servers. And also, if you want to use it for your home lab, it's great. If experiment. Uh, reasons to not use Kubernetes. Uh, when you are developing an application, I recommend not using Kubernetes because uh, it, you need to learn and understand the, a little bit of the details of Kubernetes. Uh, there's some tools like to, to help you uh, make it easier to develop using Kubernetes. And when you have very few users, uh, you also should use Kubernetes. When you can just run it on a single machine somewhere, just do that because that will save you a lot of management uh, time. Uh, you want you should keep things simple and <coughs> and anyways, if you write a good compose Docker compose file uh, for your development environment, you'll be able to always convert it later to Kubernetes manifests. Uh, Kubernetes resources using Compose. Uh, also, when you don't use uh, serverless or function as a service or platform as a service or container as a service, uh, I'll mention more later, uh, you shouldn't use Kubernetes. And when you need low latency, just like if you're doing trading. Like, like, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, when, so what I use Kubernetes for, uh, so at work actually I have a uh, containerized product, so it runs inside a set of containers uh, that can only be deployed in one instance per customer. So uh, that's, that's a limitation for now. Uh, when we use, so what we do with Kubernetes is we use it to orchestrate the deployment of the product from the cloud portal. Uh, so that there's my portal, and it, it tells Kubernetes that I want to give a customer a new instance, and then Kubernetes will then go ahead and create those that product instance and provide it to the customer. And also on my home app, so I uh, have a little uh, Kubernetes cluster, single node Kubernetes cluster running uh, CI/CD for, uh, for my own, for myself, to build some containers. <coughs> okay, I'm going to do a little demo through how do you use Kubernetes. Uh, as well as, uh, how do you get started with Kubernetes? Uh, with a little example from Compose, using Compose and Docker Compose. Uh, yes, okay. So how, one thing that is, uh, I recommend when you start using 
when you want to use Kubernetes, you can use the Docker desktop, especially if you're not using Linux. Uh, you should use Docker desktop. It gives you uh, Kubernetes cluster with very little effort. So here, you can just enable it in the, in, a, in the platform through like here. You can enable Kubernetes. And then you immediately have a Kubernetes update. It takes a while to install Kubernetes. So and you have a Kubernetes cluster running after a while. And then you can do things. Then once you're done, it, you should be able to immediately do this. Uh, you also need to install kubectl in one line. And then, oh, wait, why is my cursor not working? Okay, so here, here I have a little uh, cluster. So, if, so once you have Docker uh, desktop running, you should run any of these commands that I show you. Uh, so here, here we have a project. I have a very conventional comp Docker Compose file. So if you've used Docker Compose before, this is how you maybe have a file. Your file may look like that. Uh, so I have uh, defining three services, uh, three containers I want to run. Uh, one is the API server, one is the web server, uh, and then uh, and I added some annotations for Compose. So Compose is this little tool that allows you to convert from a Docker Compose uh, specification to a to a Compose uh, to a Kubernetes manifest. So here I just run the command compose convert and then output it. Uh, now I have this file. So this is the this is how it looks like in Kubernetes uh, resources. So here's a service resource, and so it says that this service needs to be is accessible on port five thousand. Uh, so then you can communicate any other application. Another container can run can communicate with this service using this port. And how it selects this service, how it selects which containers it wants to. So it will then redirect the container, uh, the, any, any connections to this service to a container that matches this selector. So here we have the API uh, deployment. So this API deployment will then create a container that, match, that matches the selector. <coughs> Yeah. So here's the deployment for the API. Uh, let's say that I want I want to deploy this app from this image, and then it also specifies the port here for for you to connect to. And yeah, so all I have here is just two services: one for the API, uh, and then the second service for the web UI, and I have. Uh, Deployment for API and a and a, okay and then deployment for the web and then one more thing which is two more things actually which are ingresses. So these are the ways like you redirect traffic to a container uh, that is HTTP. So if you if you study you know, okay, uh, the you have the layer seven load balancer and they are uh, layer 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 three load balancers. Right, so ingress here is a layer, layer, layer 7 load balancer. Uh, the service here is somewhat a layer 3 load balancer, if you, if you know that analogy. Uh, yeah, so then so say that I want all the traffic going to this host, avatar or local dev for me, to be redirected to this service uh, at this point. So once you have once you have your Kubernetes manifest, you can uh, simply run. Uh, 
uh, group TDL apply, and then dash F compose. So once you've installed Kubernetes, you, you should be able to do this up. So once you once you install Kubernetes, you should apply uh, Kubernetes resources to a cluster like this. And now let me show you them in Kubernetes. Uh, so okay. So now you can see that here I, I used to have uh, oh where is it? Ah uh, yeah, so here. Uh, so I have two now two pods inside uh, running. Now I have an error because I, I, I'm in the wrong development environment. Uh, let's try to get the development working. Uh, no, why is it not working? Okay, I'm going to start with alternative. Uh, so this is alternative to Docker Desktop. If you don't want to use Docker Desktop, you can use Rancher Desktop. It's almost, it's almost the same. Uh, okay, uh, so we'll give it a while to start. Because I was using a VM just now uh, for the uh, for the demo I was going to do, but then the, the VM is not has a non-working terminal for some reason. Uh, I can't really do a demo on this one. Okay, it's up. So so once you install Docker Desktop or Rancher Desktop, you can you can do this. Uh, So you can load your container images uh, inside the uh, inside the so just open it your container images and save them. Uh, I have them here now. You should be there. Yeah. Okay. Good. I'm also going to do some port forwarding in the meantime. Uh, okay. Okay, never mind. <coughs> then, uh, then once I build, uh, I can put. file. I can apply it. So now it's running inside here, inside my Rancher desktop. So one thing Rancher desktop gives you is also a nice view over what uh, over your Kubernetes uh, resources. So here, here you can see the, our our deployment. Yeah, there. So we have our API deployment uh, running here. Yep, uh, and then it's running. There's now there's also services for that, so we have the service here, and then also in ingress. So here it says that if you open this thing, okay, it doesn't work because oh, oh. ah, okay, it works. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, so so here we are running uh, the two 
uh, the two uh, components, this uh, the API and this web uh, server. So the web is the web UI and the API that this, uh, this app talks to. And one thing nice about Cree, one thing, why, why people, why communities is uh, good for, when you want to scale up, is it really allows you to just uh, say, I want how many instances and just create that. So you can say that I want, oh, thank you. I want four instances. Now I just create four instances. And then now in your pods, you have four running pods. So if you if, if your cluster is actually running on multiple nodes, uh, you would see them running. They'll be all scheduled on each machine uh, separately. Uh, yep, so then you can see the apps. Yep. Yeah, but it works. Yeah, I think that's the little demo. Uh, so really, uh, if you already have local compose, it's very easy to get started with communities. Uh, you just have to convert them into communities manifests and you can go here. Yeah. I think uh, that's all from the demo. Uh, so here are some alternatives to communities. So if, if you go and try to communities and it's too complex for you, uh, you can look at things like HashiCorp Nomad, which, really, which allows you to deploy any kind of workload, so you can even do uh, just a, like if you have a process you want to run on a machine, you can just use Nomad. It can help you download the application, extract it, run it uh, with very little effort. Uh, also, it's very cross-platform, so you can use it on Windows and Mac OS too. Uh, yeah, and you really don't need communities if you uh, have something uh, very simple. Uh, and there are other alternatives to communities, including running container as a service platforms like uh, AWS, ECS, Google Cloud Run, Azure Container Instances, and Fly.io. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's also a way to, yeah. And then if you're using platforms as a service or function as a service, they also have great alternatives if you don't need to manage the infrastructure yourself. So you can use things like AWS Lambda, uh, Google Cloud Functions, uh, Heroku, Cloud Foundry, right, I flipped it a little, uh, uh, Google App Engine. Uh, so these type of common strategies actually help you to be more robust than if you run reality communities. Uh, they, they, they are designed for like scale, so you don't have to care about it, you just write your function or you write your code, deploy it, forget about it, you'll manage communities for you. For you. So you don't even have to understand communities to use this stuff. Yeah, so if you have, can deploy like this, you don't need communities. Uh, here's some resources I recommend to get started with communities uh, if you want. Uh, there's a good documentation to give you a rough overview of communities on the website. Uh, I recommend using Docker Desktop or Rancher Desktop uh, to run the communities on your machine. And uh, K3S if you want to deploy uh, communities. Uh, finally, also, if you run fast enough cycle to clean, you can use code. Yep, I think that's all. Uh, if you have any questions, you can come up to me and ask me. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, all right, uh, thank you so much, Ambrose, for the talk. Um, okay, uh, that marks the end of our second installment of Friday Hacks for this semester. So please do scan the QR code to give us feedback if you've got any. Uh, if you have not joined our Telegram channel, do join both of them. Uh, we also talk about other events that we are hosting, including Hacker Tools and Hacker School. So yeah, that marks the end of Friday Hacks. Hope you guys enjoy yourselves, and I'll hopefully see you all next week.